a good morning to you. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Zenzel Ndevele and this is the Breakfast Club. Today we visit uh, Thorngrove Hospital where the City Council uh, was um, talking about how uh, the, COVID, the city has been responding to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. You remember that uh, a year ago, we visited Thorngrove uh, Hospital where we showing the area just before there was an outbreak of the many cases of COVID. And this place looked totally different because many of the places were dilapidated. But a year later, as we told this word, there was, uh, or the isolation center, there had been a huge improvement. The place has been painted, it has been tiled, uh, there's a lot of uh, renovations that have gone uh, at this place and it now looks like uh, a modern hospital. So we also managed to talk to the different people in the city council departments that are looking at case management, that are looking at uh, surveillance, risk communication, to get from them what they've been doing to try and fight uh, the COVID pandemic. But one thing that I have to make clear that uh, while there's been a good work that has been done, there's still some things that are lacking. Uh, the, the hospital needs an industrial uh, washing machine because currently the staff at Thorn Grove actually manually wash uh, the, the PPE or the clothes, the linen that is used at the hospital. So I hope uh, we can get this industrial uh, washing machine. The hospital also does not have, uh, this isolation center does not have any uh, ventilator. So they are only managing uh, mild to moderate cases and it becomes complicated when someone now needs a ventilator because it's not here. There's no ventilator here. So they have to be transferred to Matter Day or to UBH. So we are appealing to well-wishers, uh, companies, individuals, those who can afford to, you know, source a ventilator to please help uh, Thorngrove uh, Hospital to get a ventilator. For now, let's take a tour and hear from different people who are, wait, uh, who are working tirelessly to reduce the cases of COVID in the city of Pulawan. So as you can see, maybe we can just start from here now to here. This is the main Side. Yes, you can see the female side is just a one big ward with lots of beds. It houses 13 patients. And then this is the female side. A, a small wall and then there are cubicles. The female side, including the labor ward, houses 15 patients. So all in all, we've got a mass number. 28 to a minimum of 20 or 30 beds, and we may fit in if there is need, maybe 10 more beds. This is the doctor's room where the doctor waits for, for patients, and then this is the, the nurse's station. The nurses wait here before they before they go into the patient's uh, ward. This is the room that we have they use to don to put on the, the old stuff that you have seen people putting on as they nest the patients. Like I said, from home, we are supposed to use this entrance. Nurses or staff go in and then go into the different changing rooms, females side and males side, to change into their scrap suits and leave the whatever they are wearing from home, they live in this room. Because we are saying they are not supposed to wear the clothes that they take home in the wards. That's okay. They come out through these two corridors, either this corridor or that corridor. They doff, they remove whatever they were putting on the theater caps, the disposable gowns, the gloves, the overshoes. They remove from this corridor. And then from this corridor, they are now in their overshoes, skin overshoes, and scrubs. They go into this changing room. As you can see, the steps there and the bin there where they are going to dispose of the gowns and everything that I mentioned the other side. When they come here, they come into this room 
to shower and change into clean scrub suits. As you can see, our all our rooms are not yet finished. We need shelves in these rooms so that we put the clean scrub suits and the clean shoes that the nurses then put on as they go out to wait for the next fall. Patients come from home, they use this entrance to go into the ward. And unfortunately, because we renovated an old building, ideally patients are not, it's supposed to be a one-way flow for patients and staff. But because we renovated an old building, we do not have an exit for patients. So where they enter is the same uh, door where they exit. This is the storeroom I was talking about, the PPE storeroom. It was a small storeroom, and thanks to partners, we renovated and it maybe doubled it. ICU, the temporary ICU. Like I said, Thonfu Hospital admits mild to moderate cases. But we're also saying patients' conditions can deteriorate rapidly from mild to moderate to severe. So in case we have a patient that deteriorates, we have an ICU. We have two ICU wards that house four patients. And then we've got other cubicles in the rest of the wards. So that is the isolation one. So we're supposed to have gotten a donation at some point. And uh, unfortunately, we got uh, respirators instead of uh, ventilators. So we're still yet to get ventilators. So. If a patient is to deteriorate, we we'll then have to quickly transfer that patient to where they are based, which is UKH or Mata D at the moment. Tell us from the process you receive someone, what happens, uh, and what are the stages that we take. Okay, so from when we identify a positive patient, usually you would have gotten the, the heads up from the surveillance team that does the testing as a positive patient either from home who is deteriorated or from the isolation set at Elangi. So when you get such a, a report, you now want to verify uh, at which stage of the COVID these patients are. Because we've got an admission criteria here. We're only admitting mild to moderate cases because of the nature of, uh, of our oxygen pressurization, which is just ordinary oxygen for now. The pressurized oxygen for those that are severe to moderate to going to UBH or matter day where they put ventilators as well. So we only admit mild, mild uh, forms of COVID here. So when we establish that, the, um, the ambulance then goes and collects the special either from home or from, from the isolation center. When you get the patient here, as you saw the, the entrances where they're supposed to go in, there's a unidirectional sort of like flow of patients. We want to have the, the most contaminated or the one with the earliest uh, form of COVID so, to be coming in uh, to be at the other end of the world. And then we have those that are about to be discharged to be also <laughs> say, so, say less infectious okay, at another side of the world. So that is they are being discharged, they don't have to mix with the very infectious ones. So basically, with COVID, we are treating symptoms. Yeah, if the patient needs oxygen and they are saturated, we give them oxygen. If they were a fever, we give them paracetamol. Um, we also give uh, take some steroids to try and also open up their airways and reduce the inflammation. So basically, we, we admit the mouth forms. So if a patient then deteriorates and now needs ventilation, the same process is going to be initiated again. The ambulance will be called 
then we transfer to a small specialized center in Blaha at the moment we've got UPH and Mataki. So on average someone who comes here with uh, moderate mild symptoms, how long do they take uh, to be discharged? So it, it depends at which point of uh, of their incubation period they are in. So it differs with, with any patient. So usually by day 14 and you don't have <laughs> symptoms, you discharge you. Um, but there are some people who can go beyond those 14 days. So if they do then go beyond those 14 days, we're going to count another three days when they are now stable and don't have symptoms, then you discharge them from that. But basically it is variable. Some patients who actually come here for two days, they become stable. We send them back to Elan where they then finish off that isolation days. I mean, we, we also noticed that uh, currently one of the issues that you talked about is uh, that we don't have ventilators in this place. Uh, maybe for, for the benefit of those who might assist, how is important is a ventilator for someone with COVID? Yes, like what was saying, you can easily deteriorate very fast. Or at least you are trying to, to get you to a specialized center. It would be ideal if we actually have the ventilator here in case of transport challenges. Remember, we. Uh, the, the number of ambulances that are specialized to carry COVID patients are actually limited. The ambulance can be engaged somewhere else and it might take a bit of time. And uh, during that time, a ventilator can actually come in and, uh, and keep someone alive. That shouldn't be detected. My responsibilities uh, when we are talking about COVID-19 is uh, logistics, the mobilization of uh, logistics and uh, the resources. Uh, uh, the coordination basically of all the pillars in terms of the resources that they want from PPE to the, the fuel that they use and even uh, staff incentives yes together with uh, health insurance for, for the work for the frontline workers uh, from touring the, the center here, we've seen that there's been a lot of uh, you know, renovations that were done, and the place looks completely different from the first time we came here last year in March. How has been the response from uh, you know the corporate sector and uh, donors, individuals, and, and, and international organizations? Uh, the, the the response uh, towards the renovation of this place has been very tremendous, and we are really grateful for the support that we have uh, got from uh, private uh, uh, players and uh, the government of Zimbabwe. We got so much support in terms of uh, uh, renovation. Where there's uh, the wing, the, uh, the original wing, the, the C-Ward, the children's ward there. We had a private uh, player who, who chipped in with the renovations there. In this wing, the isolation wing, mostly it was uh, government support that we got. And um, besides the construction work that went on, we are also getting support in the form of uh, recurrent expenditure budgets. Right now, as we speak, government from time to time, actually quarterly, they disperse some funds towards the recurrent expenditure. So what did you say is your most need currently? What do you need if people have to help? Uh, currently, we have a, a number of uh, issues uh, or requirements that we need. Uh, if I may break down those, we have capital projects that are still incomplete, like uh, perhaps you would have seen the laundry. The laundry still has uh, some requirements like the industrial washing machine, even the spin dryer, and also our kitchen. Our kitchen needs uh, to be refurbished and also equipped. And then um, for the uh, recurrent uh, 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 requirements, we still need continuously, we still need uh, uh, PPE because we, we, it's, it's, uh, the, the uh, usage of PPE is quite uh, a lot in these uh, 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 facilities. So continuously, we need uh, 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 funds for recurrent expenditure.
looking at uh, the number of patients that you normally get, uh, in your anticipation, do you think you're likely to uh, you know, have more patients coming in or you, you have raised your peak? Uh, as for the trends, really, in the peak or not the peak, I think my colleagues in the, in the case management uh, 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 pillars are better placed to answer that. But uh, in as far as uh, uh, mobilizing for resources in case there's a peak, I think we are, we are, we are ready and we are, we, are, we are geared to cope with the increased numbers. Uh, we would like to also uh, uh, express our gratitude and uh, Thank uh, our uh, colleagues or uh, donors from the diaspora. We have uh, donated quite uh, an assort assortment of uh, uh, equipment as well as uh, uh, PPE for use in the uh, Thongro for isolation wards. How has been? How have you been communicating with the community when it comes to the issue of COVID? Uh, what has been happening is that we've been working with the uh, different partners relaying information to the community. So we've actually been using different communication channels so that at least we reach out as many members as possible. Ever since uh, we recorded our first case in the country, that's when we actually started, uh, uh, should I say, even before we recorded our first case, when we heard about uh, COVID-19 in China, that's when we started relaying information to the community, and we never thought we were going to get it as a country as well. But when we recorded our first uh, case in March, that's when we intensified our uh, health education, giving information to the community, and the most important thing was the preventive measures. So the preventive measures that we were mainly talking about was uh, wearing of uh, the mask, the washing of hands and where possible sanitize as well. And we're also talking about the physical distancing. And those were the major preventive measures. Uh, but then as you realize, we're still talking about COVID-19. We are in 2021 from 2020. So what we've actually observed is that there's fatigue in implementing the preventive measures in the community. Uh, people are really tired of wearing masks. They are tired of washing their hands. But we are continuing to give that information and there are also issues of behavior change. The information is there in the community. Studies have been done and they actually show uh, above 95% of information that is there in the community. But the major challenge now is the behavior change. Uh, but like I said, we're continuing to give that information. And as we get cases, the other challenge that we're facing is the issue of stigma and discrimination. Stigma and discrimination, I think it's worse than the stigma and, dis and discrimination that we faced in the uh, HIV and AIDS uh, era. And uh, as you know, that with HIV and AIDS, uh, we are three decades uh, um, uh, since we started talking about HIV and AIDS. But now with COVID-19, it's even worse, the stigma and discrimination. As a result, we're having challenges whereby the, the patients actually do not want to be admitted. Uh, like we are here at uh, Thorngrove Hospital, patients do, do not want to be admis admitted. So we are appealing to the community that they support the patients that are COVID-19 positive and that are supposed to be admitted at Thorngrove Hospital. Because if we don't support them, then they will hide once they suspect they have got COVID-19 and that will actually fuel the spread of uh, the infection. So that is what we are basically working on at the moment, the issues of stigma and discrimination, which is the biggest challenge. Well, I mean, touching me as someone who recovered from COVID, uh, the issue of stigma is very important, but also there is isolation from home. Most of the times when people are not really feeling sick, they are tempted to go out and maybe stretch, meet friends. So what, the kind of, what kind of advice would you give to people who have tested positive, but they are not sick? Uh, what we are doing, we have home isolation and also institutional isolation. So some of the clients that are not able to isolate at home, we first we do an assessment if it's possible for them to isolate at home. If not possible, then we isolate them at an institution. Currently, we are isolating them at uh, Elangani Institution. And um, for those, it's the patients that are actually asymptomatic. 
And then we've also designed a contract for the patients that breach isolation protocols. So if you are admitted at home and you don't follow the protocols, like you are saying people, you end up finding people uh, not isolating, you find them at the banks because we usually do uh, checks at home if the clients are actually isolating. At times you get there, you discover that the patient is not at home. So once they breach that protocol, then we are forced to isolate them uh, at an institution. But uh, what is required really is the support, even from the family itself, so that they ensure that that person also isolates at home. Finally, I mean, can you assure people that if they are admitted at places like Elangen and other centers, they will be fine, they will get enough food, there's everything, and they won't go hungry? Because that's the fear that I've had from people. Yes, uh, maybe the, uh, I, I, I'm not better placed to comment since I've never admi been admitted to a Lang and institution. But we've had uh, the testimonies where people have actually been admitted there and they've really um, given their experiences on how it was like at the institution. And th what they have said so far is that is the best place that, can, that they can ever be. At, because what happens is that it's not like you are in hospital where you're supposed to sit and do nothing. So you, can, you are isolated in your own room and you can bring whatever gadgets you need in that room. Mm -hmm. So it's the best place that you can ever be from, from the testimonies that we've received so far. My job is to find the cases, anyone who's not feeling well and is reporting that they're not feeling well, whether it's COVID related or not, my job is to find them and assist them accordingly. So on a day-to-day -day basis, we have teams called rapid response teams who are tasked to follow up cases. In this case, they follow up COVID-19 cases, suspected cases. So our job is to go out there and find the cases. We call it active case finding. When we find the cases, it's when someone has tested positive for COVID-19, we will have collected a specimen called a nasopharyngeal specimen, which we take from the nasal cavity. Uh, that's where it's highly sensitive. If someone has COVID, that's when you can actually pick out that someone is positive. Then you also have what you call an oral pharyngeal kind of specimen, which you collect on the throat. Usually we do that for the infants, but for the adults, we encourage that they allow us to collect specimen from the nasal cavity so that we pick out the cases. We take that to the National TP Reference Lab, and then we have cartridges, we take those to Don Cruz. That's when we, we get, after getting those results, that's when we know whether our cases are positive, the suspected cases are positive or not. Where if they are positive with surveillance, then you go out and conduct trace those activities. So in order to identify these cases, we do, uh, we actually integrate what we call event-based surveillance and indicator-based surveillance activities. With indicator-based surveillance uh, activities, we are looking at um, cases that go to the clinic and then are reported through the clinic channels to the provincial level and then we go and respond. And then with the ad hoc events, uh, with event-based surveillance, we were looking at ad hoc events where people phone in, we call those alerts or scares, and then we follow those up and usually we try and do that within 24 to 48 hours. We prioritize scares, we encourage people uh, who are not feeling well to quickly seek medical attention by not by going out to the medical practitioner, but by contacting the rapid response numbers, uh, which will be shared uh, at the end of the presentation. Yes, so that at least in the event that they are positive, they do not spread to people along the way. So we normally discourage people from moving around it. And then, uh, so on a day-to-day -day basis, when you pick out these cases, then we document and report to the next level and then try and manage the cases and monitor them for a good 14 days, which is the incubation phase for the virus. Uh, so as of yesterday, we actually reported 23 new cases, which is uh, a low number. We're saying the cases have gone down. Uh, an outbreak is uh, it's got a life cycle kind of uh, growth rate of disease in terms of disease progression. So uh, in what is called the deceleration phase at the moment is Bulawayo. We've been in what is called an exponential phase for some time, which was the second wave, and we believe the cases are coming down. We've been conducting our analysis and statistical analysis, which is actually informing that our cases have drastically gone down. But we are worried that if the drivers of transmission that initially resulted in the cases increase, increasing continues, which is the low risk perception in our people, in our society, which has resulted in people refusing to wear the masks appropriately or wearing an unclean mask 
or not wearing a mask at all, not just that alone, but that has to go with hand washing and social distance. If those three don't work together, someone ends up becoming a case. So you'll find that our cases had gone up because of that, right? And then uh, we're saying they've gone down. This has probably slightly improved. It's a sign that the behavior change is turning out to be positive. But in the event that people forget to implement the preventive measures, chances are that the cases will increase. So our first case was diagnosed on the 7th of April, 2020. And then we started contact tracing. We, we had sporadic cases and we, that was called our lagging phase where we had very few cases. Then the cases uh, started increasing at an exponential phase. That was our first wave, right? And then eventually the cases plateaued and decelerated and people thought that there were no cases at all. But eventually we started another lagging phase and went into our exponential phase on the 5th of October. We noticed that we had gone into our exponential phase. So since then, Bulawayo has been struggling with the second wave and trying to inform people that COVID is there. We have cases out there, but people do not seem to believe it's there because you find that 95% of our patients do not have symptoms but are positive and highly infectious and may actually spread to someone who will end up being symptomatic and suffer the consequences. So I was saying we normally want to manage both the asymptomatic and the symptomatic. So maybe our population hasn't seen someone dropping down and uh, deteriorating rapidly because of COVID, but we've seen it. We're reporting deaths. Yesterday we reported three new deaths in the institutional deaths. We're looking at people who sought medical attention, but if you look at it, it's people who actually went quite late. They stay at home until they are critical. Then they call for help. By the time they're taken to the health facility, it, 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 it's a mammoth task to resuscitate them and they end up uh, demising because of COVID-related uh, symptoms or otherwise. So we normally call them COVID-related deaths because they may have died of COVID or because of comorbid conditions. Then through our statistical analysis, we also realized that we characterized the deaths as well because they were on the high side initially, but now they've also started going down. If we compare this past week and the previous one, the past week is called Epidemiological Week 5. If you compare it with the previous one, Epidemiological Week 4, the cases have slightly gone down. Uh, we reported 196 cases this past week. Compared to Epi Week 4, we reported 270 new cases. But as of uh, this past week, we reported 14 deaths. Uh, compared to the previous week, we reported 15 deaths. It was just a slight decrease, but it's still low. But we're saying it's, uh, people shouldn't be dying. Kindly report that you are not feeling well so that you are assisted accordingly in good time. And may people agree to be admitted because it's so that they can be managed appropriately by clinicians. If they're all scattered at home, it's difficult to monitor someone on home isolation. It's very, very difficult because of lack of resources. We cannot have a st staff members going house by house, checking if people are doing okay. And we're also putting our families at risk. If we put them first, then at least people will be encouraged to seek medical attention. For their symptomatic, we take them to Elang and it's an institute of, 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 of learning, but and with dormitories, it's habitable. And for people who've given us testimonies that they've been admitted there, it's actually quite habitable. The meals are, are actually okay. Uh, and then for the those who are symptomatic, uh, it's been mentioned already, they're admitted here, thorn curve, if they're mild to moderate, then UPH if they are uh, mild to moderate and slightly severe, then if they are worse uh, and need ICU, uh, UPH sometimes can manage, but usually matter day is the best for those ones. But we're saying we're encouraging guys to be admitted. So if you look at it, we're saying cases have gone down. If you look at the percentage of burden of cases that were reported yesterday for Bulawa compared to the national one. I just did a quick uh, calculation. It's actually 20% of the cases that were reported yesterday nationally were from Bulawa, which is not bad, but it's still not good. We want that to get to zero and we can't do it alone as health workers. We have to work together with the community. It's a give and take. Let's work together to bring uh, this outbreak to a stop because we need the community to do their part. Let's report all those who are not feeling well, who may be at home or who are breaching quarantine protocol. You find that we have problems where we have people waiting for their results at home. They are milling around. But I was saying, while you wait for your result, you stay at home. We've designed a type of contract for people on quarantine and those on isolation to ensure that if they breach it, they are liable, they can be charged It's an offense. We take a copy to the police, we keep one, we give them and tell them 
strongly that you are on quarantine, you shouldn't be going anywhere, wait for your result. In the event that you turn out positive, we do not worry much about where you've been, although we can still come in contact trace. So we're saying, guys, may they not preach that, because those have been some of the drivers of transmission. People preaching quarantine protocol. Quarantine is when someone has been tested while they wait for their result. Before they know it, they're on quarantine. After they know their result and it's positive, then they're going to what you call isolation, of which we isolate someone without symptoms for 10 days. Then we de-isolate them according to the WHO de-isolation protocol, which was adopted by the country in, in May last year. And we are saying someone has recovered because they are no longer spreading to the next person. But you'll find that some people still want to retest and complain that they're still positive. May they not bother to do so because it's not adding to any science. It's not adding value to anything. You've been discharged. You may still carry the RNA for COVID in your body for some time. For I think for some, they go up to 90 days with the RNA, but you're no longer spreading. But we discharge them day 10. If they've had symptoms, it's on day 14. We had three days on top. Day 14, they're discharged. And we ask the community to accept them back into the community. May they not stigmatize them. Let's learn to live with COVID. And let's take care of one another and uh, assist each other to overcome uh, this burden. And then just a quick one on the percentage burden of our deaths that we reported yesterday. We reported three, and nationally there were 18 deaths for Zimbabwe. So ours was 16% of those were ours. It's bad. So our case, what we call our case fatality rate so far, is low, it's good. Cumulatively, is at 0.03%. If it's below one, it means that our deaths are actually uh, on the low side. We're not saying death is acceptable, but we're saying the number of people who are dying compared to the cases is low if the case fatality is below 1%. So it's a 0.03 cumulatively. If you look at our 198 deaths cumulative uh, over the 5,085 cases, it's low and it's good. Let's maintain it and get it to zero so that people don't die if they seek medical attention early. And then we are saying, why we are saying our cases are going down? We're looking also at our positivity rate. The total number of cases versus the number of tests done within that day. So our positivity rate um, as of yesterday, if I look at yesterday's cases, which we reported, it's 23. And the total number of tests that we've done for Wulawa, it's 504. It was at 0.04%, which is good. We're saying if your positivity rate is below 5%, it means that your number of cases is going down. So normally we also do calculations like the disease growth rate. It also did show that the cases are going down, comparing the previous week to this one, which is why we were saying we we're actually on the deceleration phase. But any time it can shoot back up to the exponential phase if the main drivers of transmission continue. I think people need to take note of that. If they relax and let their guard down, the cases are going to increase. And we need to help each other so that the cases actually uh, continue going down until they are at zero. And then uh, I think our the recovery rate is high. It's actually at 90% as we well, allow, and it's good. And we pray that people continue recovering until we no longer have any COVID. I've heard people you know, talk about COVID. They think that maybe it's a certain age group. I don't have to worry because I'm young and it's the only the old people. But looking at your, stat uh, your statistics, would you say the people who get affected will die of COVID? Is it a particular age group or is it throughout? Uh, let me start with the cases. COVID is affecting every age group. Our youngest COVID case is two months old, was old, is two months old, and then our oldest is actually 89 years old. So it affects all age groups. And then in terms of our deaths, uh, it, it affects actually all age groups as well. Uh, our median age uh, that has been affected in terms of our deaths that are COVID related so far is 51 years it went up from 45. So we've had people as young as 45 actually dying because of COVID-related uh, uh, illnesses. So, it, so, so it, it doesn't matter what age group, anyone can be affected, anyone can die. Although uh, the, the, I think the strongest correlation to the deaths in terms of characteristics was comorbid conditions, with the highest one being hypertension followed by diabetes mellitus. So those were the most common ones and those that were dying. So you find that having diabetes is a risk factor if you have COVID. Having hypertension is a risk factor. And then you find that most males are actually dying because of COVID compared to the females. And then in terms of our cases, most females are suffering from COVID compared to the males. But when it comes to dying, it's the males who are dying.
Despite all the challenges, the good news is that currently uh, the cases are going down. The number of people uh, who are dying of COVID are also going down. But it can only take the same behavior that we're having now to make sure that these cases actually continue to go down. If people don't follow uh, the COVID protocols, if people go to their normal life of not social, I mean, social distancing, not wearing masks, we can find ourselves back to, you know, to the pandemic where we have serious cases and the cases are growing. I think it is up to us as the people of Pulau, as the people of Zimbabwe, to manage this COVID. So with the proper and you know, following of our COVID uh, uh, protocols, we can definitely win the battle against COVID. So I would like to thank uh, the staff at Thorn Grove Hospital, the city of Pulau, and everyone who has participated in making sure that this place is hospitable. It is a hospital. We, we have had that they've thanked the individuals, the companies, the people in the diaspora. We have come big to donate, uh, to contribute, to make sure that Thorn Grove is a hospital place or is a hospitable place where you can admit patients. My name is Zanzel Ndebele. Till we meet again in other programs, have a good day.